All right, we'll get back into some bugs. I put a table on the um, board, which I will talk through here in a second, but we're going to finish up our discussion on our cocci bacteria, starting with Necessaria. So our Necessariaceae is a, our first gram-negative cocci and one of the more gram, important gram-negative cocci to know. Um, these necessary ACA gram negative cocci family like to live in mucous membranes. Um, you can have necessaria, bromonella, and moroxella. Uh, necessaria is going to be the most common and probably the most commonly seen that we'll talk about um, because the two primary human pathogens are necessaria gonorrhea and necessaria meningitides. Obviously, you can see which one causes which, right? Necessaria gonorrhea. Is going to be your classic gonococcal infection, your STI. Necessaria meningitides is going to be your meningitis. Okay. Both of these are gram negative cocci, circular. So, our necessaria genus, it's gram negative, it's bean shaped diplococci. So, it's circular, but it kind of has this like little impression, almost like a kind of like a brain or a heart sometimes. Um, they don't have flagella or spores. They can be cap encapsulated and they can have pili, so they can um, adhere to mucous membranes very well. They don't survive long outside the host. They can be aerobic or microaerophilic, so they like oxygen. They're oxygen loving. They produce catalysts because they live in oxygen states, um, and they often have to grow on specific types of media. So necessaria gonorrhea. Um, this is going to cause gonorrhea or STD. Factors can that contribute to its ability to cause this STD include fimbria or fimbrae, it means it can stick to mucous membranes really well. Uh, it also can slow down phagocytosis. It has IgA protease, so it can break down IgA antibodies. Um, so it can avoid being tagged by those mucosal antibodies, breaching part of that mucosal barrier or that mucosal innate immune system. Um, it's strictly a human infection, top five STDs. Um, it won't survive more than one to two hours on fomites. Uh, so this is, you can't get an STD from a toilet seat question. Um, so your diagnosis, it's asked, you'll get asked it as a doctor, I promise you. Um, yeah, anyways. Okay, so how are, it's gram stains, it's gram stain negative. It likes to live intracellular. Um, it loves actually neutrophils. So it can, loves to infiltrate neutrophils. Um, you can find it in urethral, vaginal, cervical, or even in eyes. Um, they have penicillinases, but not as many as our uh, staph origin or staph species. You can have a recurrent infection, and this is reportable. Other virulence factors for the meningitides versions. This is our gonorrhea version. Meningitides version, they have capsules. They also have IgA protease. They also have fimbrae but they have endotoxins. So necessaria meningitides get some endotoxins, which is going to cause a much more uh, symptomatic infection, right? Anytime we have an endo or exotoxin. There's lots of strains, 12 different types. A, B, and C cause the majority of cases of meningitis. Um, and we see this as a prevalent cause. And we'll talk about the causes of meningitis here based off of age in a moment. Um, we can see this as a nasopharynx reservoir. So some people are carriers. Um, people who are more at high risk of getting meningitis from necessaria are people living in close quarters, children aged six months to three years, as we'll see on our table up here, um, children and young adults and 10 to 20 years old, especially if they're going to college. Um, and this can bacteria can enter into the bloodstream and cross through the blood brain barrier permeating the men meninges, and then they will grow and proliferate in our cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, your onset of symptoms is rapid, and that's thanks to its endotoxin. Okay. Um, when you have those endotoxins being released, uh, you could see hemorrhage, coagulation, vascular damage, and even death of tissue. So that's why this is something that if caught fast, it's treatable, but the longer you take to catch it, the more severe and permanent the damage can be. Because if we're having this occur in our meninges next to our brain, obviously you can see why necrosis of that tissue would be dangerous. Um, because of the hemorrhage and coagulation response that the endotoxin causes systemically, that's how you can get the petechia associated with meningitis, where you're pushing on the skin, that rash, and it's not blanching. 
but it's only in about 50% of the cases. The meningitis infection I've seen did not have petechia, so. That was an ER case. All right, this is again, that kind of walk through differentiation, which I don't think you need to know. The other genus of gram negative cocci and coxobacilli will not come up as common, but just so you have the name recognition, Bromella, Meroxella, and Actinobacter are the other gram negative cocci. Um, Bromella, Cateralis, this is a nasopharynx infection. It's really only opportunistic. Um, Meroxella, you could see it in mucous membranes, Actinobacter, very rare. And then common cause of meningitis in young adults. Um, would be Nasera. Okay. So those of you online, I will paste this into the chat during our next break. But on the um, board, you can see I wrote meningitis and then some categories. Neonates to young infant, that'd be under the age of six months. Um, infant to young child, think, you know, any child that's before puberty. Um, teens to young adults, after puberty into young adult age. And then older adults, this would be like your adult grown up people after they are out of their probably like childbearing years into their elder stages of life. Okay. So, and then this is the etiology, the most common etiologies of meningitis in these age groups. And there's some crossover. The easiest one to remember is teens to young adults because there's only two strep pneumoniae, and necessaria meningitides. Those are your two for this age group. So teens to adults, these are the two that are associated with your meningitis infection. If we go up to our neonate and young infant, we have our group B strep that comes up, specifically strep agalactiae. You also have another strep species, strep pneumoniae is present here. So two different strep species present in this neonate to young infant. E. coli is also present because this can happen if infants are passed, as they pass through the vaginal canal, if they're exposed to E. coli, that could potentially set them up for an E. coli meningitis, depending on obviously the infant's um, exposure, the infant's birth, the traumatic nature of it, how early are they born, et cetera, et cetera. And then Listeria monocytogenes, that's the other common etiology in this age group right? Could there be mixing and matching? Sure. These are just the most common, and this is CDC and Merck. That's where these lists come from, okay? Um, infant and young child, necessaria meningitides is one of your top ones that you'd want to consider for infant young child. As we can see, it's not here for young infant and neonate, right? So this is a change. So any change, we want to take notes. Um, strep pneumonia, group B strep are still present, so present in both groups here. In this group, we've lost listeria and we've lost E. coli in this young or this um, infant to child. And we've gained Haemophilus influenza. Obviously, we have a vaccine for this now. So it's less common in vaccine prevalent communities, but in vaccine non prevalent communities, you can still see this commonly in this age group. Okay. And then I mentioned here, we essentially kept necessaria and we kept strep pneumonia. These are the only two in this teen to young adult group for common associated meningitis. And as we get into older adults, we keep strep pneumonia, we drop necessaria meningitides. We add back some previous ones though. We add back listeria monos monocytogenes, H flu and group B strep, okay? They will often ask you, um, they'll present a case, they will give you an age or age, obviously, of your case, and they'll give you a bunch of bugs and they'll say, what's the most common etiology of meningitis for this patient? Um, often they will do really well about if it's a neonate or young infant, only giving one of these options and then not giving you know, other ones that are in this category, but sometimes they won't. Sometimes they will give some in the same category. So if that does occur, I would choose strep for neonate, necessaria for infant young child, pneumonia for teens young adults, probably pneumonia for older adults as well. Questionable though, because they think they, they all are, you know, they're all like interchangeable there. But if you had to choose one, that's probably what I would do. But ideally they'll give you just like, they'll just give you E. coli if it's a neonate, and then they'll give you necessaria, and they'll give you 
something else that's on H flu, and then something else that's like not even a cause, right? So that's typically what they'll do. Typically. Yeah. Same question about like the CSI fluid. Yes. Metatitis. Yes. Like protein versus bacteria versus yeah. viral. They could ask on MPLEX. Um, I see that sometimes, although I see that more on MPLEX 2 because it's more diagnostic. So you'll see that more on MPLEX 2, CSF concentrations, protein versus sugars versus bacteria versus blood. Um, so I would, we'll look at it a little bit when we do neuropath tomorrow, um, but I would see less of that on MPLEX 1 and more on MPLEX 2. Yeah, great question. Awesome. All right, we're leaving cocci. We're leaving circle bacteria. And we're going to bacteria that look like rods. Negative, positive, negative, positive. Now oh, let's do positive. That'll be more fun. Okay. We're going to do our gram positive bacilli lecture next. So, those of you joining online, that's where we're going. Okay. All right. So, categories that we've gone through so far staff, strep, and necessaria. That's really the big categories we've done thus far. So our medically important gram positive bacilli. Oh. oh, what was the answer for that question about? Oh, Nasir, great, perfect. Okay, medically important gram positive bacilli. So these bacilli, these are going to be um, now our rod shaped bacteria, gram positive, so are gonna stain purple. Um, we're gonna have three general groups of gram positive bacilli, ones that form endospores, ones that do not, and ones that are shaped weird or irregular, okay? So these are gonna be our three major groups that we're gonna look at for our important gram-positive bacilli bacteria. Um, this is kind of a schema that you could look at. Again, this is like our diagnostic flow chart. If that helps you, great. I have it listed here. It kind of goes through. These are our endospore formers, our bacillus and our clostridium. Our non-endospore formers, our listeria and our, our erysipelothrix are irregular shapes. We have corneobacterium, propriobacterium, mycobacterium, so all the bacteriums, actinomyces, and nocardia. So we'll, we'll look at all of these here. First to note on endospores, I mentioned this is like that suspended animation state that a bacteria could go into to protect itself from not positive conditions. It only occurs in gram-positive bacteria. Um, and the two that you need to know, the two genus is bacillus and clostridium. These are the two medically important. Um, the majority of endospore forming bacteria are motile and they're rod shaped. And that is true for both bacillus and clostridium bacteria. They're resistant to a lot of stuff. So they can be hard to get rid of. So our bacillus genus, these are gram positive. They form endospores. They are motile. They, are, they have aerobic and catalase positive. Um, they are versatile in being able to break down different macromolecules. They can eat a lot of different stuff. Um, their primary habitat, they like to live in soil. And the two ones I want you to know is bacillus anthraxis, anthrax, and bacillus serous, which is a food poisoning type. So these are the two important ones I want you to know of genus bacillus. And I would know mainly that they're gram-positive endospore-forming motel. That would be the virulence components I would know about this category. So bacillus anthracis um, causes anthrax. It has exotoxins and polypeptide capsule, so it's hard for uh, the immune system to find it, and it can cause edema and cell death. Um, the majority of anthrax cases that aren't bioterrorism incidents are reported from livestock. Um, you can have three types of anthrax infection, cutaneous, pulmonary, and GI. Um, it depends on where it's entering from, right? Cutaneous is going to enter through the, through the skin. That's where you can get the SCAR or the ESHAR. Um, it's our black sore of necrotic cell tissue death. Pretty gnarly looking, but this is the least dangerous. You cut off that portion and you're typically good to go. Um, your pulmonary is inhalation of spores from animal products or soil. This can cause a pretty significant pulmonary infection leading to respiratory death and damage. And then GI is ingested spores. This is very rare. It would be lethal. Okay. Um, that's really all you need to know about anthracics. Uh, I've only seen this asked as a bioterrorism question on NPLEX or asking about spores. So that's really the only time I've seen anthrax come up on NPLEX. 
Uh, Bacillus cirrus is common airborne and dustborne. Um, it's grown in food and it can survive the spores cooking and reheating, which is why it can be dangerous. Um, if you do have a food that is toxin containing with Bacillus cirrus, you'll typically have nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, diarrhea for about 24 hours, and then you'll see things resolve. Uh, no treatments needed. It's increasingly reported though in immunosuppressed individuals. That's it for Bacillus cirrus. Okay. That's it. Easy peasy. We got those. All right. Clostridium, the other friend of our uh, gram positive spore forming bacilli. So it's a spore forming rod. It's anaerobic and catalase negative. So it would not do well with oxygen. There's lots and lots of species. Um, we'll look at a few of the ones that are most clinically relevant. Clostridium perfringens, it, we can see this is the most frequent clostridia involved in soft tissue or wound infections. This is our gas gangrene or myonecrosis. Someone brought this up, I think, week one or two. Um, we'll see the spores found in soil, human skin, intestine, and vagina. Uh, anything that could predispose this really are incisions that get infected, a compound fracture, a diabetic ulcer. Think about things that um, infections or skin wounds or things that are relatively serious where potentially soil could get involved. Um, virulence factors, uh, there's alpha toxins, which can cause tissue destruction and hemoly hemolysis, collagenase, hyaluronidase, DNAase. So there are a lot of vir virulence factors here with clostridium perfringens, which is why this infection can be um, so damaging to the tissue because it can destroy, it can move itself through collagen. It can move itself, it can create capsules. So it's hard to detect. <clears throat> there are two forms of gas gangrene. Um, you'll see in anaerobic cellulitis, bacteria spread within the damaged dead muscle tissue. They'll produce toxins and gas, but it'll remain local to that area. Um, in true my myonecrosis, it's much more destructive, extensive, and can look like necrotizing fasciitis. Um, you'll actually see spore germination within the tissue and vegetative growth and release of full virulence factors. And you'll see the bacteria will actually live on muscle carbs. It literally is like eating your muscle to live and survive. So pretty bad tissue destruction. Neither are great. True myonecrosis would be much worse than the anaerobic kind of gas gangrene that's localized. So mode of transmission for Bacillus cirrus, it's going to actually be ingestion is going to be the most common mode of, of Bacillus cirrus. Remember Bacillus cirrus was our food borne infection for our Bacillus species, not Clostridium perfringens, which is what we just talked about. That's our entry through wounds through the soil. All right, so Clostridium tetany, our next Clostridium species, spore-forming, gram-positive rod. It's a neuromuscular disease that causes tetanus or lock jaw. Um, it's essentially due to the early effect of the, on the jaw muscle. Clostridium tetany lives in soil and also can live in the GI tract of animals. Um, the spores typically enter the body through an accidental puncture, right? You step on the rusty nail. That's when we typically think about um, a tetanus infection. Uh, it could enter through other areas or other means as well. Uh, you need an anaerobic environment for vegetative cells to grow, grow and release the toxin. So this would not be something that could live in a really aerobic state. That's why it does have to be like punctured in through tissue typically versus on the actual cell surface. If it was a scrape wound, less likely it's going to be able to germinate from that spore versus a puncture wound. If it can get inside that tissue, then it could germinate because it's not exposed to outside oxygen. Um, tetanus spasm. We talked a little bit about tetany versus um, like botulinum toxin, right? We talked a little bit about flaccid versus spastic paralysis, but tetano or tetanospasmin, this is the neurotoxin that causes paralysis by binding to our motor nerve endings blocking the release of neurotransmitters for muscle contraction inhibition. And so you essentially have the locking of actin and myosin together. And so you're constantly having that muscle stay in a contracted state. It can't relax. Um, death is typically due to paralysis of respiratory muscles. Um, you can see this is kind of your neonatal tetanus where you have that like arched appearance that we classically see. Um, you can see this potentially in geriatrics, IV drug users, neonates in developing countries if you don't have access to antibiotic or the um, vaccine. Okay, that's your tetanus. Your C. diff infection, um, so Clostridium difficile, 
So we have lots of clostridiums we got to know, right? So clostridium difficile um, is the second most common intestinal disease after salmonella in an industrial country. So in the U.S., C. diff would be the second most common intestinal disease, like infectious intestinal disease after salmonella, gastroenteritis. This lives in the intestine normally. Um, it's So it, we would call this opportunistic then because it lives normal in our intestine as a normal resident. They, it does produce enterotoxins that can damage intestines, is our major cause of diarrhea in the hospitals, specifically antibiotic associated. We mess up the gut flora. This is a normal resident. If we have a really strong antibiotic and we get exposed to a, a larger dose potentially of C. diff, or if our own flora kind of goes out of whack, we can get this C. diff infection. Um, we see it more commonly in community acquired diarrhea, but previously it was really only seen in hospital settings. And that's, that's really C. diff. It causes diarrhea, hospital associated, antibiotic associated. That's your C. diff. And then your last two kind of food poisoning ones, we already talked about one, um, but we'll talk about the other as well. Clostridium botulinum, um, rare, but intoxication typically from home canned food. This is your flaccid paralysis. And then clostridium for perfringens, we already discussed, um, you'll have more of a mild intestinal in, in illness. Um, it's the second most common food, form of food poisoning worldwide. Okay, so clostridium, we already saw perfringens up here, up front, associated with gas gangrene, myonecrosis. This would be a cutaneous infection, right? Now we're talking about an oral ingestion of clostridium perfringes. And we're looking at that. We're looking at second most common form of food poisoning worldwide versus C. diff. I don't know why people are coming in here. I feel that maybe. Oh, well, we're here the whole time. I'm sorry. You can come join us. We can talk about, they're like, oh, I don't want to watch that. Um, yeah, I took out the gas gangrene pictures. Um, maybe I should have left them in, scared them off. But um, Clostridium difficile, C. diff, whereas our C. diff, second most common in industrial, like industrialized countries, the United States would count as that. Clostridium perfringin, second most common worldwide. Okay, so a differentiation there of etiologies or epidemiology or um, incidence prevalence. So a little bit more on botulinum or botulism. So C, C clostridium botulinum. Um, if you ingest canned food that's canned poorly and you ingest botulinum toxin or the actual bacteria, um, you the spores essentially have to already be present. Um, the bacteria typically isn't in its actively divided state when you ingest botulinum, but it could be. Um, when you when the spore actually gets into a place where it's anaerobic and it can germinate and start to grow again, that's when it produces botulinum toxin. That's when that toxin is released. If it stays in its spore state, it wouldn't form or wouldn't release the toxin. So it does have to get back into a, an environment where it can start producing that toxin again. Um, it's carried then to our neuromuscular junction and it blocks acetylcholine release, therefore not allowing acetylcholine to bind to nicotinic receptors. So muscle contraction can't occur. So um, the times I see these questions asked are in comparison with clostridium tetany, clostridium botulinum, and talking about the type of paralysis or what's happening at the actual muscle to prevent or to cause these conditions. So clostridium botulinum is blocking acetylcholine release. The actual neuromuscular junction cannot get the signal. The acetylcholine is not binding to the nicotinic receptor, has nothing to do with actin and myosin. Versus the clostridium tetany, we can't get actin and myosin to release, so the muscle can't relax. Hence the flaccid versus um, spastic paralysis. So you can see things like double blurry vision, trouble swallowing, full neuro neuromuscular symptoms. And this is an example of your little motor neuron end plate, and then your vacuole, your acetylcholine, and then your, your binding. Infant and wound botulism. So infant botulism is ingested spores, germinate, release toxins, same, same. But this is the most common type of botulism we see in the U.S. would be infant. It's still rare, but it happens more commonly than we would like. Um, 
A component that adds to this is our neonatal intestine and the resident microbiota of the intestine is not fully developed. So there's not a lot of defense here. So the spores can really gain a foothold, germinate, and start producing that neurotoxin. And this is your floppy baby syndrome, your baby flaccid paralysis. Um, wound botulinum, uh, this would be entering in through the skin cutaneously, could still cause and would still cause food poisoning symptoms. We can see this in IV drug users. Okay. And then your clostridial gastroenteritis, this is caused by clostridium perfringens. This is food that has not been cooked thoroughly enough to destroy the spores. Spores can survive a lot of heat. They can germinate and multiply, especially if it's left non-refrigerated. Um, and so you'll have a classic gastroenteritis, but you typically have a pretty rapid recovery. So clostridium perfringens in the gut, not so dangerous. Clostridium perfringens in the skin can be deadly, right? You can, your clostridium perfringens in the skin, it's going to eat away at your muscle tissue. But in your gut, your gut's gonna probably kill off with your acids and your proteases and all those other pieces of your, your GI system. So you're not gonna feel great. You probably won't die. There you go. So here's your different, your table between your species, oxygen requirements, motility, disease, and treatment, don't care about treatment. But a few interesting pieces, Bacillus anthracis has to have oxygen. So that's interesting in that there's not many that need oxygen to live. Um, the other ones, these four here, all your clostridiums cannot deal with oxygen, right? They are oxygen hating. They have to have an anaerobic state to survive. And then Bacillus cereus can live in both. botulinum toxin on neuromuscular junction. Okay, so those are our spore forming. Botulinum, especially in infants, can be associated with honey. Yep, infant botulism. Thanks, Hannah. So those are our spore forming bacilli, gram positive. Clostridium species and our bacillus species. Okay, cool. All right, now our non-spore spore forming bacilli that are gram positive. Um, the two medically important ones, really the one is Listeria monocytogenes, which we have on the board as a cause of meningitis. Um, so that's the one we'll mainly pay attention to here. Listeria, it's non-spore forming, gram positive. You can see it in coxobacilli to these long filamentous forms. Uh, there's flagella, so they are motile. They don't have capsules. The immune system can bind them. Um, really, they're beauty or how they're virulent is they can replicate inside cells in the cytoplasm after getting phagocytosed. Um, so they can essentially get phagocytosed by a macrophage, get out of the phagosome without being destroyed, and then start repl replicating in the cytoplasm. So they can avoid some of our humoral immune system by not having antibodies be formed against them. Pretty tricky. So listeriosis, the primary reservoir is soil and water or even in animal intestines. Uh, you can see contamination in foods and they can grow that contamination during refrigeration. The majority is associated with dairy, poultry, and meat. Um, often the symptoms are mild or subclinical in normal adults, but in immunocompromised patients, fetus, neonate, it can affect the brain and the meninges and you can have a 20% death rate. And so that's why we can see our Listeria monocytogenes affecting the young or affecting the elderly, potentially more of our immunocompromised. Um, diagnosis and control, I don't care about that. All right, that's really all I need you to know about Listeria. Gut food infection, fine. Brain infection in the young and the old, not so good. Meningitis, okay. Gram-positive, bacilli, non-spore forming, motile, that's probably good. Can replicate it inside the cell. Okay. Erysipothrix. I don't think they're going to ask anything about this. Yeah. Okay. So listeria. The other non-spore forming bacilli that are gram positive have a little bit of an irregular shape. And we'll look at a few of them. Um, the medically important ones, corneobacterium, propriobacterium, mycobacterium, all the bacteriums. Actinomyces nocardia. So corneobacterium diphtheriae, our diphtheria, that's obviously important pathology to know. The rod is more curved and tapers at the ends, but it can look very different. So it has not really a clear morphology or morphogenic shape. Um, 
any healthy carrier who has corneobacterium diphtheriae could potentially become pathogenic. So the potential for diphtheria to um, develop is always present. Uh, the majority of diphtheria cases are in non-immunized children in crowded and sanitary conditions. It's respiratory droplet spread. So there's two stages of the disease. There's local infection that happens from the actual bacteria itself. This is typically an upper respiratory tract infection. This is where the primary site of infection takes place. Your classic sore throat, nausea, vomiting, swollen lymph nodes. And this is where you'll see that classic diphtheria pseudomembrane. Um, that's the formation of a membranous structure in the back of the throat. It's kind of grayish in location and it can build up really large and it can actually close down the airway if it gets too significant or too thick. You could also see a secondary infection of the skin but typically the primary infection for diphtheria is of the upper respiratory tract. That's stage one. Stage two is the toxin produced by diphtheria, the diphtherotoxin production and toxemia. And this is where you can get organ damage by having it damage heart and nerves, which obviously if this stage occurs much more significant and severe in a diphtheria infection. Neither great, but stage two, the toxin itself causes more pathology, okay? So identifying that pseudomembrane is often a place where we diagnose. So if they mention pseudomembrane at all in the oropharynx, think diphtheria. That'd be a good connection there. Okay. Propionobacterium is kind of like corneobacterium, but the most common condition is propionobacterium acnes. So this is our acne vulgaris bacterium that's associated with that acne. It's not always the cause, right? But it could be a contributing factor. It's in our sebaceous glands of human skin, typically. It's normal flora, um, but when the skin gets disrupted or irritated or too dry or too oily, um, increased sebum production, all the things that can occur with acne, that's when you can see this bacteria essentially grow out of proportion to its normal flora state. Um, you could potentially see infections of the eye and artificial joints with this bacteria, but really I would associate it with acne. Gram positive, um, kind of rod, non-spore former. Our mycobacteria we've talked about already, this is our tuberculosis, our acid fast bacilli. It will stain kind of gram positive, but really it doesn't take up gram stain well because it has a lot of fat in its cell wall or cell membrane. So this is why we use an acid fast stain. It's strictly an aerobe, it needs oxygen to live. It does produce catalase to be able to live in those oxygen states. It's non-motile, doesn't have spores, doesn't have capsules, and it's that slow insidious grow, right? Seen with a TB type infection. So mycobacterium tuberculosis, um, this doesn't produce any ex exotoxins or enzymes that can contribute to its infectiousness. But what it can do is it has these waxes because if it's so fatty, um, it can prevent being destroyed by lysozymes or macrophages. So even if it's phagocytose, it's often not destroyed by a lysozyme. So it can live with inside a macrophage and it can contribute to that granuloma formation that we see in the lungs. Um, and you can actually view and you can see if you took some cellular cuts of tissue that's infected with TB, you could see macrophages that have actual mycobacterium, the fatty casts, the bacteria inside of them living after they've been phagocytosed. And so that's a great virulence factor it has. It contributes to its ability to not be identified. Um, that's why you can have a latent TB infection and not actually know that you're infected. Um, predisposing, we common think, commonly think of predisposing factors, obviously being a part of the healthcare system, but um, inadequate living conditions, access to medical care, previous lung damage. Um, there's a lot of things that can contribute to TB. It is pretty infectious. So if you are exposed to someone who has active TB, there's a high probability that you could get infected. Um, they estimate that a lot of people carry it, but not a lot of people actually have it. The bacteria is really resistant and airborne droplets is how it's spread. Only five to 10 people in actually develop the clinical disease or condition. So if you did get exposed to it, it's unlikely that you'll actually develop into full active TB or disease. It's a slow progression. It's mainly in the lungs and you can see primary tuberculosis, secondary tuberculosis, or disseminated. Primary is your classic infection. Secondary would be like a reinfection or reactivation after a latent stage, and disseminated would be outside of the lungs. Um, 
as I, like I mentioned, it will be phagocytosed by our alveolar macrophages. It can multiply within the macrophage because it avoids being actually um, broken down. After three to four weeks, the immune system will finally be able to identify it and start attacking it. It forms these tubercles and these granulomas containing a central core of bacilli surrounded by white blood cells. So it almost gets like walled off by the immune system, which is great. But since they aren't killed, then often the bacteria can continue to grow and damage the actual lung tissue right there. Um, the center of the tubercle will break down into like necrotic mass. Um, and those lesions, eventually the bacteria will run out of food to eat. So they will die, but that lung tissue has died as well. And so then you'll see these caseous lesions. They'll gradually like heal over via calcification, which is some of the x-ray signs we look for when we do an x-ray, when we're trying to find if someone has active TB versus latent or um, prior infection for TB. If you don't fully recover, let's say you took antibiotics but didn't complete the course, you can get a, a reactivation of TB again, um, and you can potentially get extra pulmonary symptoms, although that's uncommon. It's pretty deadly if it's not treated. This is kind of the process of like latent versus recurrent TB. Extra pulmonary TB, typically lymph nodes, kidneys, lung bones, even GI tract, brain, and meninges. If this happens, you're likely seeing um, death. It's hard to treat if it gets out of the lungs. It's not impossible, it's much more challenging. They should not ask you about testing methods outside of acid fast, because that's micro. Okay, the other mycobacterium, they love testing about leprosy. I don't know why. Um, so leprosy, mycobacterium, leprae, Hansen's bacillus or Hansen's disease, it's a strict parasite. Um, it is the slowest growing of all bacteria. Um, it multiplies within host cells in packets called globi. And it causes leprosy that um, skin, mucous membrane destruction that eventually could go into the nerves. Uh, it can be transmitted through a lot of different ways, but we're not quite sure how. We know that there could be cutaneous spread, but then there's maybe not cutaneous spread. There might be respiratory spread, but then there's not. Um, once you're infected, it's not necessarily highly virulent. You really have to have poor health and living conditions to see like the active disease take hold, partially because it grows so slowly in the body. Most of the time before you're going to see symptoms, the body could clear it. Um, so it's really if your immune system is compromised or if your dose is so large, if you're really living around a lot of people with leprosy. Um, what happens with leprosy is macrophages will phagocytose the, back, the bacilli. Um, the macrophage um, or the T-cell response may not kill it fully. It can be have an incubation period of two to five years before you actually see symptoms. Um, it'll start to grow in your skin macrophages and swan cells of peripheral nerves, um, so affecting myelination. And you can see two different forms, tuberculoid and lepromatous. Uh, you can have more than one type of at one kind, and you can progress from one to the other. Really, what I most commonly see them ask you about is the disease itself, acid fast nature. Um, that's the most common kind of like association I see with leprosy asked about when it comes to this test. I wouldn't worry too much about knowing about the different two different types. Uh, I would not can be concerned. Um, no, I wouldn't worry about either of those. Okay. These are just the other mycobacterium like infections. I don't think you need to care. All right. So mycobacterium tuberculosis, mycobacterium uh, leprosy, obviously TB and leprosy are going to be your big common ones there. Both acid fast staining, both bacilli gram positive ish. Um, but don't really take up staying well. Both can evade phagocytosis. Both can divide intracellularly. Oh, question. Armadillo reservoir. Yeah, that's a good one. Oh yeah, that was on my inflex. Um, the reservoir for leprosy is an armadillo. Reservoir meaning like vector. That's a great one. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, yep. That was, that was our favorite question. We're like, what the heck? Armadillo? Leprosy. It's the only one. 
Actinomyces. Um, this is a filament-based bacteria. It looks, it can relate kind of to mycobacterium. It can cause a chronic infection of the skin and soft tissue. I would be shocked if they tested you on either of these. Um, maybe nocardia because it stains like tuberculosis. So it's also acid fast. That's the only reason I would maybe see a nocardia question is if they're asking about acid fast bacteria and they gave you two bacteria, like mycobacterium comma nocardia, mycobacterium comma ureoplasma or something like that. I could see them doing something of that nature. I otherwise, it's not clinically relevant enough for them to likely test you on it. All right. Okay. Perfect. All right. We got through the next hour. I'm going to type into the chat during your break the meningitis table I posted online or posted on the board for the online folks. So we'll take a nine, 10 minute break. So we'll start back up at 10.02. We're going to finish bacteria and then we'll move into viruses. Okay. Great. All right, so online folks, I'm gonna put into the chat the table that I placed online. Because I don't know if you can see it. This is for etiology of um, meningitis. If you have a question, then. 